Yeah, so um, Jan is a third semester uh, bachelor student uh, at the computer science department, and he's interested in computer architecture and uh, hardware security with a uh, background on uh, theoretical computer science as well. And today he's going to discuss a paper about how to exploit memory errors to attack uh, programming languages and more specifically the Java virtual machine. Uh, Jan, uh, Jan, you can start. Okay, so today I'm going to present the paper called Using Memory Errors to Attack a Virtual Machine, which was published at the IEEE Symposium on Security and Privacy in the year 2003 by two authors from the Princeton University. And I'm going to, how can I advance the slide? Okay, then I'm going to quickly jump into the executive summary. And because this is a security related paper, it has a different form factor. I'm going, about, uh, going to talk about the observation the authors made, then the key idea they had and the implementation for their attack, as well as the key results and the takeaways. So the main observation they make is that type checking systems are safe only under the assumption that a computer faithfully executes its specified instruction set. And they notice that this premise is false under the assumption that there are hardware faults, especially memory errors. And the key idea was that they could write some program which would lay out the memory in a certain way, such that if a bit flip occurred, they could overtake the system by conducting a type confusion attack. And the key result is that they were able to write such a program and they could exploit a single bit flip in their program's memory space with a probability of about 70%. And they had, ex they had the ability to execute arbitrary code. And the main takeaway of the paper is that virtual machines that employ type checking as a security mechanism can be vulnerable to memory errors or can be vulnerable to attacks that exploit memory errors. Now I'm going to cover the outline of the talk. So I'm quickly going to give an introduction into some background information that is relevant for the attack. Then I'm going to cover the exploit in more detail. Then I'm going to take a short detour into the security anal an analysis they make in the paper. Then we'll look at the ev evaluation of the attack and finally some potential countermeasures. So for the background, I'm going to talk about the general concept of isolation. Then I'm going to introduce the type checking mechanism. And because this paper mainly focuses on virtual machines, especially the Java virtual machine, I'm going to quickly introduce Java applets and Java cards. And finally, we're going to look at memory errors, what they are, and how we can induce them. OK, so let me start with isolation. The concept of isolation is basically everywhere in, in computers, because everywhere you have to somehow separate trusted components from untrusted ones. And the main mechanism to do this in computers nowadays is virtual memory. So you separate processes by operating each of them in their separate virtual address space. Another mechanism that works for protection would be type checking. And this can be done in sound type systems. Now, what is a type system? So a type system is a, a set of rules that applies a type to some constructs of a computer program, which could be a variable or a function and with this type, there come rules. So you have to define interfaces uh, in which you define how different types can interact with each other. And now what is a sound type system? This is a special, a special property of some, some type systems. A sound type system rejects all incorrect programs. 
So every evaluation of an expression is guaranteed to match its, its static types. So it's like it should be impossible in theory to escape this type system. OK, now what is type checking? Type checking is just the verifying the act of verifying and enforcing the constraints of a type. So we basically enforce that the type can only do what is specified in its interface. And type checking can, do, can be done in two different ways. One of them will be static type checking, and one of them will be dynamic type checking. Um, I'll discuss what those two are in the next slide. And the, the main goal of type checking is to ensure type safety. Now, type, type safety is the is the term that we that we do not allow any conversions or operations that violate the rules of the type system. So if we have type safety, we can guarantee that nothing bad ever happens, basically. And now, why do we want to do type checking if we already have the, the concept of virtual memory? Now, type checking allows us closer coupling of trusted and untrusted components. So in the case of a virtual memory and a, a program, uh, a virtual machine and a program that is executed in said virtual machine, like we don't want to really use virtual memory for this. So in the case of type checking, we could use um, object-oriented shared memory interfaces to communicate between those two components. And there is no need for message passing or remote procedure calls. This also means that we can use the same address space for, for the trusted and the untrusted components. So there is no need to, to somehow communicate between different address spaces, which of course is kind of a trade-off. So do we want uh, the security of, of virtual memory or do we want the speed we gain by type checking? So in theory, it shouldn't be a trade-off because for sound type systems, type checking so, uh, should be safe. But as we'll see later, this is not the case under every circumstance. OK, so because this, this paper focuses mainly on the JVM, I'm going to look at type checking in the JVM. So type checking in the Java virtual machine is done at linking time or at compile time. So the type checking is static. And how does it do it? So it simulates basically the program execution, and it determines whether the types or yeah, the, the expressions result in the, in the correct type. But we only do this once. So like every instruction is only executed once. This means we don't go into, into any loops and stuff like this. So it has a reasonable runtime. And after the code is verified, we trust this code. Now, why does it make sense to trust this code? Because we know that we're in a, in a sound type system. So technically, after the code is verified, it should be type safe, which means that it shouldn't be able to do anything bad. And in the Java virtual machine, the type checking pro process is done by some component called the bytecode verifier. Um, Java also does some, some checks at runtime. So it has some dynamic type checking components, but it only checks for, for casts and for array stores. So it only checks for things that cannot be known at compile time, for example, down casts or array accesses that could potentially be out of bounds. But what this paper realizes is that all these proofs and correctness proofs and soundness proof of proofs of type systems are all under the assumption that if we write the value and read the same location again, then we, we get the same value. But in the presence of, of memory errors, this is not always the case. So this makes virtual machines vulnerable to a so-called time of check to time of use attack. So this means that the program can change after it was checked, but before or while it was executing. So then, of course, the, it shouldn't be trusted anymore because it does something different than what we checked. And yeah, I want to like jump a little bit back in time because this paper was published in 2003. So I want to cover Java applets and Java cards. Um, Java applets are small programs with very few privileges, so they have almost no network access, and they don't have access to the file system, and they can be executed in the JVM. Java applets were very common in, in web browsers back in the day, so you could like download some Java applets and execute them in a sandbox, 
and they'd give you some some visual output and why this is important like it is especially important in the context of java cards so this paper is especially relevant in the context of smart cards java cards are a special type of of smart cards and java cards allow like they're just normal smart cards so they contain a small multi, uh, microprocessor and they allow the execution of applets and normally like a smart card stores some secret information which is placed there by the manufacturer and usually no applet should be able to access this data because it's i don't know personal information cryptographic keys if they're used in physical access control also the the pin numbers were stored on on the card itself so in theory they should be temper resistant so nothing executed on the card should be able to access this data and this is why this, uh, the attack I'm going to show is very relevant in the context of, of Java applets or Java cards. And now I'm going to look at, at memory errors, like what are memory errors. And in a very general memory system, it's just the incorrect recall or the complete loss of information. And in the context of computer memory, we discriminate between soft and hard memory errors. So Soft memory errors are a single event or multiple event upsets. So it's just a change of state in a single or multiple bits. And these changes are, are transient. So they only last for a short time. And they're mostly caused by some kind of disturbance. For example, a row hammer, but it could also be some, some cosmic ray that hits the circuit and flips a bit. On the other side, hard memory errors are, are permanent. So they result from some defect in the circuitry. For example, if there is a defect in the manufacturing process, then we can have hard memory errors, but, and they are permanent. But this paper mainly focuses on soft memory errors. And now we want to take a, a quick detour into the frequency of memory errors. So how often do errors in DRAM actually occur? And like in the very old days, so even before the year 2000, memory errors were quite common and this had this was due to the reason that the packaging material emitted some some radiation which induced memory errors and by refining the process they were able to reduce the number of, of memory errors induced by the packaging um, so the numbers were quite low in the year 2000, 2003 when this paper was published so in the paper they report like one one memory error every several months. So you'd have to wait quite a few months to encounter a memory error. And they expected to the rate to go down even further. But in 2009, Google published a paper where they measured their, their error rates in their DRAM. And they found about three and a half thousand correctable errors in DRAM per DIM slot per year. So that's about 10 per day per dim per year. So it went up quite a bit. So this is way higher than expected and way higher than five years before that. And since then, I don't think it has gotten any better. Okay, so now how can we, or what are the causes of, of memory errors and maybe also how can we inject them? And one cause would be, would be alpha particles. But the problem with that is that they don't penetrate matter very well. Another option would be beta rays, but they interact too strong with the, the material surrounding the, the actual memory. Then we'd have X-rays, but like a normal sized X-ray creating machine is like doesn't get enough energy into the rays. So any any machine that would produce X-rays of high enough energy is not very portable. So conducting attacks with it is kind of difficult. And the same goes for high energy pro protons and neutrons because you'd need to carry around a particle accelerator, which is kind of difficult. And the last one is infrared. So you can, you're able to induce memory errors by infrared, so by heat, because electrical components become unreliable at heat or at high high temperatures, which is quite common knowledge. So that's also the, the technique they used in their attack. 
So I want to present some related research. So what has been done before concerning the exploitation of memory errors. So some of them try to, to break cryptographic protocols using random hardware faults and recover some secrets, which was done in 1997. Uh, another paper was about tampering with temper resistant devices and security processors by inducing errors at specific locations at specific times. Um, but as we may already see that the current paper differs quite a lot from the existing research, so it's quite new. And now that we have covered all of the relevant background information, I want to go to, to explain the exploit in depth. And first we have to cover the, the threat model. So what situation do we have to be in in order to conduct the attack? And in this case, the target has to be a virtual machine that uses type checking as its protection mechanism. And we have the ability to provide a verified, so a type check program, which is then loaded into memory and executed. So we have to have a chosen, chosen program attack. And we assume that we have physical access to the machine. Um, this point is not really necessary. So you could say, we'll just execute the program and wait for a memory error. But for now, let's just assume that we have physical access and that we have no control over the data memory of the program. So even though we have physical access, we do not really have any control over the memory itself. Okay, now what is this attack trying to do? What we're trying to do is a so-called type confusion attack. So what we wanna do is we want to break the type system. And we do this by obtaining two references of different type that point to the same object. So in a type system, an object should only ever have one type. So as soon as we have two references with different type to the same object, we have literally br broken the, the type system and therefore it is not type safe anymore. And as we'll see later, we can do arbitrary stuff with this. So we'll see that we can write and read from arbitrary locations which allows for remote code execution. Uh, no, arbitrary code execution, not necessarily remote. Okay, so how, is the, how does the attack program work? So for the attack to work, we're going to construct two objects. And because this was published in 2003, we're going to assume a 32-bit machine. So we're gonna construct two objects, object A and object B, which have a size that is a power of two, like the size of the object is a power of two, including the object header. And the object A acts as the, the pointer object and the object B acts as a filler object. We'll see how those names can come into play later. Okay, so now our program is going to lay out memory. And we're going to lay out memory as follows. So we're gonna put, or we're gonna allocate one object of type A into our memory and as many objects of type B as we can fit. So one object of type A and the rest is filled with objects of type B. And as we can see, an object of type B consists of all references of type A. So all those references point to the, the object of type A again. And the, the singular object of type A has a few references of type A, which point to itself, obviously. Then we have one reference of type B, which points to an arbitrary object of type B in memory. And we have some integer i. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna wait for a bit flip to happen. So we've now laid out the memory in a favorable way. And now we're gonna wait for a bit flip to happen. Because we don't want to spin forever, we, have, we, we need some way to detect bit flips. So we're going to iterate over all objects of type B we have. And we're gonna check if all references that those objects B contain still point to the object of type A. And we repeat this until this is not the case anymore. So if we stop in this loop, this means that we have encountered a bit flip. So a single, a single event upset. And for further analysis, we're gonna assume that our singular object A lies at the address X in memory. So all references in objects of type B store the address X. So they point to the singular object of type A. 
Okay, so now in the attack they used, their object size was, was uh, 2 to the 10 bits, uh, bytes. So an object in their attack had the size 2 to the 10 bytes. And now if some, like every reference in an object of type P stores the address X, we have concluded that. But now if a bit flip happens, we're going to discriminate between in which, in which position this bit flip happened. So if the bit flip happens in the bits 10 to 27, this means the address stored changes by more than the object size. And because our memory is filled with all B objects, uh, the new reference is now very likely to point to the header of an object of type B, as we can see in this figure right here. So our address, which is stored in the object of type B, gets hit by some cosmic ray and the bit is flipped. And then the new address points to some other object of type B, where the difference is exactly two to the i if the ith bit was flipped. If the bit flip happens in the bits two to nine, however, the, the reference address changes by less than the object size. So our new reference points somewhere within the object A, the object of type A, or within an adjacent object as we can see in this figure right here. And what happens if any other bit flips? Any other bit flips, uh, any other bit flip is not good because it causes our program to crash. Because if any of the very high order bits flips, bits flips, then our address is now pointing out of bounds of the allocated heap, which is not good. And if one of the two low order bit flips, then our address is not properly aligned anymore to the size of an address. So this would cause our program to crash as well. And now to, to conduct the attack finally, we look at how we, access, how we access the object. So if we access the object X, uh, the object A, we're just going to access memory at the, the address X. If we access the B field of this object, we're just going to access memory at the address X plus some offset. So we'll keep this in mind for later. So let's assume we have a lot of objects of type B and there occurs a bit flip in the, in the object B384 and it occurs in the, the reference A6. So the reference A6 initially points to the object of type A, but after the bit flip occurs, the address is now pointing to somewhere new. And so in this example, the object size would be two to the power of five and not two to the power of 10, but that's just because of space constraints. So we see if the bit flip is higher than bit five, then we point to, the, to a header of an, of an object of type B. And if the bit flip is lower, then we're pointing somewhere within A or adjacent to A. But what we can see is that if we access memory at the new address plus offset, we're pretty much guaranteed to access some reference of type A, even though it should be a reference of type B if we look at the initial X plus offset. So we're pretty much guaranteed to encounter the address X at the new address plus the offset. And now we can confuse the type system with this. So let's assume we have some reference of type A, which is called R. We have some reference of type B, which is called Q. And we have our, our B object, B384, in which the bit flip occurs. So if we assign to the reference R the, the reference A6 of the B object, and then the reference at B object, so R.B should store the address X, this means that Q is now a reference of type B, but is pointing to the object of type A. So it points to the wrong object type, which means that we have a, a type confusion, confusion. And this is finally what we wanted to achieve. Now, how can we exploit this? I said that we can execute arbitrary code with this. And this works as follows. So the first thing we do is we have or we assume two references of different type that point to the same object or to the that store the same address. So let's say 
we have AP and BQ. And what we're going to do, going to do is that we write some address minus the offset into the integer of P. And then we're going to interpret the address we just wrote, or we interpret the integer we just wrote as an address by calling q.a6 on the, on the other reference. This means we just wrote an, ad an address into the integer, and now we're interpreting this, this integer as an address. Because as you can see, p.i and q.a6 are at the same memory location. So what happens if we now write a6.i with value? This means that we write value at the memory location of the address stored in p.i or in q.a6 plus some offset to access the i field or the field i. This means we're going to write at the address address minus offset plus offset. So this means we're just going to write at the address we specified, which then allows us to read and write a, an arbitrary address, which we can specify. And this allows us, yeah, as, we, as I said, to read and write arbitrary addresses in the address space of the trusted process. Why the trusted process? It's because we don't have like isolation between the trusted process. They have the same address space because we use type checking and not virtual memory. And with this, we could do several exploits. So either we could fill an array with machine code and then just jump to jump to set set array and execute it. An easier way would be in the Java virtual machine, there is a class called security manager. And this is the class that enforces security policies at security policies at, at runtime. And this has, for example, a field called file access. So if you overwrite this to true then your program suddenly has file access and lets you do arbitrary stuff with the, yeah, with the, like you have the same, same rights as the, the trusted process then. Okay, so this was how we conduct the attack. And now I'm going to quickly go over the security analysis they do in the paper, but I'm going to, go over this very quickly because I don't think it's too interesting or relevant. It's just a theoretical approach to, to predict the, the probability of a positive outcome. So they calculate the probability of a single bit flip being exploitable. And they do this by counting cousin numbers. So a cousin object. So a cousin object is an object whose address differs by a single bit. And from this, they get to a formula with which they can predict the, prob the, the probability of success depending on the system they're using. And they, they even show that even multiple bit flips can be exploited, although the probability is a bit lower or the success rate is a bit lower. Now we're going to, into the evaluation of the attack and the methodology. So they used three different sets of experiments. In each of them, they had a Java virtual machine running, running a process. And in the first, experiment, they, they flipped bits in the, the process's address space. In the second experiment, they flipped bits somewhere in physical memory, so not necessarily in the process's address space. And in the last one, they used a lamp to heat up the memory until it became unreliable and bits flipped, and they tried to exploit this. And what were the, the results? What was the attack performance? So if the bit flip occurs in the memory of the process, we can see that the success rate is about 70%. If the bit flip is somewhere in physical memory, so not necessarily in the process's address space, then our success rate is somewhere between 32 or 38%. Um, in, the, in the last experiment where they used the lamp, we can see that the success rate is also nearly 70%, from which we conclude that they were able to, to focus the heating on the parts of, of the memory that were used by the process. OK, now there are some other th things we have to discuss. And one of them is the exploit before crash ratio, because as we've heard before, that 
some errors can crash the system. This can either happen while dereferencing or while garbage collecting of the objects. And the probability of exploitation before the system crashes is about 70%. So in 70% of the cases, we're able to exploit the system before it crashes. Um, and we can increase this number by only exploiting safe bit flips. So the bit flips between 10 and 27 are safe because we know we can figure out what object they point to. However, the, the bit flips in the bits two to nine are indistinguishable from the bit flips in the very high or low order bits, which could result in a crash. So by not using those bit flips and only using the safe bit flips, we can improve the, the exploit before crash ratio to about 95%, which is pretty good. Okay, now let's discuss the potential countermeasures which they provide in the paper. Um, one countermeasure would be error correcting memory. So memory that uses error correcting code to detect and correct errors. And if we wanted to correct one and two bit errors, we'd have a, a memory overhead of about 12 and a half percent. Another approach would be parity checking. So storing an extra bit that stores the parity of all set bits. So basically just an XOR, which would allow for error detection, but not error correction. And the third approach would be, or the, pro, the third approach is software error logging, which goes in hand with error correcting memory. So you just log the occurrences of, of corrected errors. And if the, the error rate climbs too high, you would just adapt the behavior. So maybe shut down the program or disable untrusted programs, which would help recover against the attack or make the attack, impo the attack impossible. And all of these protection mechanisms have one fatal flaw, and it's that they don't cover the whole data path. So all of these just cover the memory, but the attack doesn't really care where the, the memory error occurs. So even if the memory er error occurs on the bus, you'd still be able to exploit it. So even if there's error correcting memory in place, the attacker could potentially inject the errors on the bus, which would not be detected and corrected by the protection mechanisms, and the exploit would still work. And for the conclusion, I want to come back to the executive summary. So as we've already heard, the key result is that they could execute arbitrary code if there is a bit flip in the program's address space. And the main takeaways are that virtual machines that employ type checking are vulnerable to attacks that employ memory errors as well as chosen program attacks should alter the assumptions under which protection mechanisms are designed. And that hardware error detection and correction and with software logging of errors is the best defense we currently have, even if, it, even if it's not sufficient. And before I, I jump to the critique, I wanna allow some questions if there are any. So they say they have a 70% probability of executing this exploit, right? 70 to 90% or something before the program crashes. How yes. long does it usually take until, do they ever mention a time frame? Like how long does it take for the program to crash? Uh, or, or the exploit to work? I mean, this entirely depends on how reliably you can induce errors. So for example, the crash rate was I think they conducted about 3000 attacks and like they, the crash rate due to the Java virtual machine was about 23 out of those 3000. So most of the crashes are if the memory errors occur somewhere else in memory. And for example, with the, with the lamp, they had to figure out which temperatures like gave the best results. So if the temperature was too high and they, like the temperature temp temperatures rose too quickly, then your, your program would crash pretty quickly because like memory just goes, goes stupid then. But if you only like use the safe bit flips and yeah, and have a, a reliable way to induce errors, then it shouldn't crash, but they don't, 
note uh, like they don't say anything about the speed of it, like how fast it crashes. But depending on the method you use, it could be very fast. Um, you mentioned in the beginning that uh, one possible solution against this um, was uh, having different, uh, uh, um, as having virtual memory and different memory spaces. Yeah. Um, why didn't they mention this in the paper? Is or why is that not a solution against this specific attack? Well, so why don't we employ virtual memory even in in those circumstances? Yeah, have, have just a. Two different processes with a virtual memory, and and each pro uh, each program runs in a different process. Yeah. Processes. Okay. I, I don't know the intrinsics, but it's probably just uh, a matter of speed. So, if you really use the virtual memory stuff, then you just slow down your performance too much because, like, it should already be executed in a virtual machine. So, you'd, you'd like have two layers of of some virtualization you'd have to go through, which may be too much. Okay. for it to be relevant but it might be entirely possible nowadays so that was back in 2003 so like the computers were less capable so maybe it would be possible now maybe it is even done now i'm not sure about this are there any other questions maybe on zoom oh there's one in the back yeah so, so your idea would be to move the security critical parts of the JVM into a separate process, basically. Right, that's the applet thing, right? But the thing is that your 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 Java virtual machine will, will probably still have one virtual address space because it's one process, usually. When, right, when you, when you run different Java programs, I think you get different, different virtual machines, right? You yeah, get one for each Java, Java program. Sorry. You have one virtual machine per process you execute. Right, yeah. But the problem is that the virtual machine runs privileged, while the applet inside the virtual me machine should not run privileged. So you'd have to have some like, yeah, you have to isolate them be between each other. So you'd somehow have to execute the applet without the, the trusted part of the, the of the JVM being in the same address space. Does this even have any security implications for non-applet Java applications, just normal applications? So as we said, it, it only has implications for, for virtual machines that use type checking. The, this attack is not relevant for anything else, like right. this attack in, in specifically. Right, the, the, yeah, the thing is that with an applet, you have uh, the assumption that this applet will not be allowed to access network and file system and stuff. But with a normal Java application that I'm running, the assumption and the, the permissions that it will get will probably allow it to write to memory and uh, file system and network and that kind of stuff anyway. Like it's just a normal process usually. So yeah. does this have any, does this allow a normal Java application to do something it's not allowed to do? I mean, technically it should, yeah. But normally, if you run Java programs on your computer, you usually know what they what they do, or you accept the risk of running them. Whereas applets are executed automat automatically in some cases, like without further security checks. But yeah, I mean, if you want to crack your own JVM with the program you wrote, you you were probably able to do it with this attack. Okay, then I think I'll continue with the critique and maybe get to other questions later. So what were the strengths of this paper? So the main strength is that it was a very novel idea. So it was the first paper that used memory errors to overtake a system. As I've mentioned earlier, there were other papers with 
which already like used errors to some extent, but they either didn't have the same success rate or like they didn't use it to to compromise the system, maybe just to like break some or make make it unusable. And furthermore, we have the relevance to this day. So the core idea of this attack is still very relevant to the current day. So type confusion attacks are still used and are caught in the wild from time to time. And the exploitation of memory errors became very relevant again after the publication of a certain paper co um, covering the row hammer effect. And it inspired a lot of research. So after this paper, a lot of other papers were, were published covering implications of memory errors. And another, another strength of this paper is that it has very strong verification. So they have shown that their, that their attack works. So they have provided a proof of concept. So they have shown that it works in the real world and that it affects a high number of systems. So Java Virtual Machine was and is still very relevant. The same goes for the, for the .NET virtual machine. So the number of affected systems was very high back in the day. Now to the weaknesses, I think the, the attack model is very, or the threat model is very utopian. So you assume that you have a chosen program attack and you have physical access. So either one of those is kind of common, but to have both is, very rare. Another weakness is that the, the protection mechanisms they proposed are not really satisfactory because they, they don't solve the problem. Now, one could argue if this is really the purpose of such a paper, but I just mentioned it anyway. And then for the experimental results, so as we've seen in the, in the graph, so they, sh they said they are going to to do the, the experiments on two machines, but whereas they really only did it on one. So I found that kind of disappointing. And for the, for the heating experiment, they had a very small sample size. So they conducted their attack 15 times, which in my opinion is enough to prove that the attack works. But in my opinion, it, it is not enough to like deduce an, an attack success rate from it. Because yeah, it could just be based on probability that they reach this percentage. And in my opinion, the writing is kind of unstructured. So the paper is lacking some red line to follow when reading it. And my ideas and takeaways, so how could we improve this? So my first idea was that we could do error, correcting, uh, error correction in the processor. This would solve the, the total data path problem. So it would solve errors on the bus and in memory. But of course, it would probably slow down the processor. So we have a trade-off again between speed and security. Another one would be that we enable dynamic type checking for the referencing, for example, which would cover this attack. Or we could like try to, to, co to enable dynamic type checking in general. But this, of course, again, slows down the computer and the execution. Another possibility maybe not to mitigate the attack completely, but to slow it down a lot would be address space layout randomization. So randomizing the, the key data positions on the in memory. So maybe base of executable position of stack heap and libraries. So this would make it kind of difficult to, to read and write to, to important locations in memory. But it would, I think it's still possible, or maybe it is possible to somehow leak your own address and for there you can like do the attack as it was proposed. And another one that may be slowing down the attack would be marking certain pages in memory as non-executable or read-only. So this would just make execution of arbitrary code harder, but probably not like alleviate the problem in its entirety. Okay, so this would be my critique. Now it'd be open for questions again. If Okay, there is one. But uh, uh, making the pages non-executable would only really help a little bit, right? Since yeah. You, then, then you're not allowed to execute machine code, but any kind of Java, Java bytecode is still 
fair game. Yeah, Because true. The Java virtual machine probably doesn't check if a page is actually executable. This may be true, yeah. I don't know the intrinsics. But certainly making pages read only would maybe help because then you couldn't overwrite certain stuff in the security manager, for example. But I don't know the, the Java virtual machine enough to know if those pages have to be writable in order for the JVM to work. But that's just a proposition on my side. Okay, so if there are no further questions, I'm going to go to the discussion. I don't think we have time to cover all the, the questions I prepared, but let's just start the first one. So is it possible to enable dynamic type checking with low performance over, overhead? So can we somehow enable dynamic type checking? Can you see a way on how to do this efficiently? It's just inherently an overhead, right? Uh, checking the type of every object every single time is just True, a lot of work. Can you think of some mechanisms to speed this up enough so that it is viable? Maybe just randomize this, this type checking and just check for some, some uh, references. OK, so you'd have a probabilistic approach. So with a certain probability, you check the type, and else yes. you don't. I mean, maybe yeah. that would, would, would generate a low performance overhead. But, but I mean, it's also not, uh, yeah, maybe not the most satisfying solution. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how high you'd have to set the probability of a check, because like in the in the case of this attack, there was only like one one operation which actually violated the the type safety. So you'd have to to hit this exact operation, and I don't know if that would be feasible with a a probabilistic approach. In, in addition to the performance overhead, you would also get the memory overhead, right? Because you have to then store somewhere um, what type of memory you're dealing with. What do you have to store? Uh, the, the type of the... So currently with the static type, um, then you, um, you only have to store the memory location and you know already that it's uh, of this, this and that type type A's, let's say, but then um, then you would also have additionally um, store perhaps in the header of the memory location. Okay, that's this and this type. Yeah, I don't know where Java actually stores the, the static type, but it could be in the object header. But I see another comment on this. Right, the dynamic type is, I think, pretty much always calculated. You, you always have a dynamic type of an object even at runtime. How do you calculate it? You, you, an object has, has a type. Yeah, by type. evaluating the expression, you will come to some type, or should at least. When you, when you construct the object, you're giving it a type. Yeah. And that's, that's part of the object. The type is part of the object. Then you can change the reference to the object, but the type information is is retained as far as I know. Yeah, so, so it stores the, uh, on the object that it has this type. Yeah. Okay, but but if you're static type, it, then you don't need to store it. So it's... so the, the 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 object information is always stored. Oh, okay. For the the for Java. For Java, for the for all of these objects usually. The, the the information is lost on the references, not on the actual objects, as far as I understand it. Okay, yeah. So there is already some 
or ha there has been some research done in this direction. So there has been the approach to, to add architectural extensions to replace software-based dynamic type checking and do it in hardware. So it has an automatic, it has automatic type checks for memory operations in hardware. So this obviously requires some changes in the architecture and I don't think it has been implemented, but it, it was some approach back in 2011. And another more recent approach was some hardware software hybrid mechanism that just removed certain checks in optimized code. So they figured we don't need this check, so we can just remove it, which also sped up the, the execution of the type checking. I think it was for, for JavaScript or TypeScript, one of the two. So then I want to I want to skip this question because it's not too interesting. Um, can you think of any other attacks that could be performed with the same threat model? So you have physical access and you have chosen attack, a uh, chosen program attack. What else could you do with a system if you have this scenario? I mean, I can I can run any Java app that I'm presuming, and I have physical access to a system. So yes, I, true, but access to the system could be like maybe you have user privilege, for example. If you have physical access to a system, then you can do a lot more than run a Java applet. Yes, true. So what what else can you do? Uh, you can start snooping the memory bus. You can start to exfiltrate the memory. You can. Okay, so you can play man in the middle, the basically. Memory, you can... Or at least snoop. Yeah, snoop the bus. Why not to exfiltrate data? Yeah, it also depends on on what system are we talking about. I mean. Yeah, if it's a like a desktop system or laptop, then it's easy. You could just remove the memory, put it into somewhere else, and get the data that way. Um, but if you if you have literally like a card where, where everything is in one circuit, then it's probably a bit a bit harder to do. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Maybe one place where you'd have physical access would be like a telling machine at a bank. Maybe you could tamper with this one. I just wanted to, to mention two. One of them would be cold boot attacks. So that's a technique where you basically remove the DRAM and freeze it and take it to another machine and boot it from there so that the DRAM retains its content. Or that you like just boot the system from a, a removable disk and then just make a memory dump from there. And this would circumvent full disk encryption because the decrypt, like the key for decryption, is already in memory. Another one would be Rohammer JS, which is a a remote software-induced fault attack. So basically, it's a Java JavaScript framework which leverages Rohammer to yeah to to trigger Rohammer even from from like scripting environments. So this could pawn your machine from maybe a web browser. So you don't even need physical access in order to exploit memory errors. And yeah, I think I'm going to skip the rest of the discussion as it's already pretty late. Um, I just want to mention this. So are there other ways to exploit memory errors? And the answer, one of the answers is Okay, no, both of the answers are pretty clear. So there has been research done, mainly leveraging Rowhammer to, to exploit bit flips in, or memory errors in every possible way of the imagination. But with this, I'd like to conclude the discussion and my talk as a whole. <laughs> okay, thanks, Jan. Are there other questions or discussion points. I know it's quite late uh, for everyone. 
Okay, this was a very good presentation, Jan. Thanks. Uh, and you referenced a lot of interesting papers for sure. Uh, that Eurocrypt paper that you referenced is actually quite good one in 1997 that basically shows that uh, random hardware faults can be exploited from a theoretical perspective uh, to break cryptographic uh, protocols. And if, if people are interested, I would recommend looking into that. It was a very theoretical paper, of course. Uh, so this paper that you presented uh, showed practically how to exploit random bit flips in memory to essentially do something similar. It's not exactly attacking a crypto, crypto, crypto protocol, of course. It's, it's more like uh, going, like circumventing the safety guarantees of type safe systems, right? Uh, and taking over a virtual machine, which relies on type safety to provide safety or sandboxing uh, to programs. So this paper, I, 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 I like your analysis quite a bit. And this is one of the earliest papers that practically shows how a, a hardware's, hardware reliability problem can be exploited and turned into a security attack. Uh, in that sense, it's very significant. Uh, and I, uh, that's one of the reasons I wanted to actually uh, include it in the seminar. And great, I'm glad that you picked it uh, uh, to, to discuss for sure. And your analysis is quite on target actually. Uh, maybe I'll share my screen quickly. Uh, to uh, show you some slides that I use in the computer architecture course. Uh, let me do that if I can find it. Okay, I found it. Yeah, <laughs> this is how I actually talk about this paper. Uh, in a sense, this is like life before Rohammer, right? I think you mentioned also. Uh, and this is actually, it, it was clear to people that uh, bit flips, random bit flips in memory could actually lead to uh problems like security problems and but the issue as you mentioned is physical access right uh, these bit flips how do you introduce them to a system to a real system uh basically this paper showed that you needed physical access but that assumption is quite strong right once you have physical access to a system then you can do a lot of other things as you discussed uh i think what what has changed with rohammer is uh, that physical access requirement has gone away, basically. So what happened, uh, just, just to give you a historical perspective, this paper was published in 2003, as you know, and it was interesting. Yes, it was actually very, very clever, I think. And I read it actually long before we developed the Rohammer. Uh, uh, we, 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 we found Rohammer, basically. Uh, but uh, it was mostly dismissed as impractical, right? This sort of attack is either impractical or you get into the situation in very uncommon cases. Uh, I think Rohammer made it very interesting because this attack is easily applicable if you can induce these bit flips in software clearly. And later, of course, many people have showed other attacks on Rohammer. And these are some examples. Just to continue your list, you mentioned some of the papers over here, but there are a lot of attacks that are based on Rohammer in the security community, as you can see. Uh, this is actually not a comprehensive list. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, I mean, you can see some uh, interesting names also, right? You can see SGX bomb, etc. cetera. <laughs> I, I, I like this, of course, and I don't want to take a lot more time, but you can see that these attacks continue. I and mean, you saw another one uh, just now. I, I just want to give you a quick retrospective on this because this is actually interesting. Security community, uh, I mean, certainly people were aware of the, of the issues of hardware faults, but if you cannot really easily induce these hardware faults, uh, then... Uh, uh, it may it may become easily dismissed, right? Uh, uh, and I think uh, that is what happened, basically. Even though this paper is extremely good, uh, what really enabled these uh, fault attacks uh, to become much more popular and much more investigated in the security community is really the discovery of Rohammer. It really enabled this new mindset uh, that led to a renewed interest in hardware security attack research, because. Now you can see that real memory chips are vulnerable in a very widespread way, right? Uh, and uh, this hardware reliability and security connection is really now mainstream discourse in the security community. And I don't think it will end unless uh, we find a good solution to Rohammer because people are clearly publishing Rohammer attacks. You've seen one just before this uh, presentation. And I think we need more solutions uh, to, let's say, make it go away. I mean, we know the solutions, of course, right? We've also covered uh, some of the solutions. Uh, but how do we do it efficiently 
and securely at the same time is the question, right? You can always, as you said, there's always a security performance trade-offs, but today there's also a security performance and efficiency trade-off where security is on one side and performance and efficiency on the other side. How do you kind of merge them at the same time and get both security and efficiency and performance at the same time is the question. So I think it's fascinating uh, that we're examining these papers at this point in time, as opposed to let's say in 2010. If you were looking at this paper in 2010, for example, uh, we wouldn't have the same perspective. Maybe we would be dismissing this paper that you've just presented. Uh, I'm talking about the uh, IEEE security and privacy paper. We would be dismissing this paper saying, oh, this is not practical. Who would this, uh, do this attack, right? But right now, I think you revisit the paper in the presence of new evidence, which is Rohammer is one example. I believe there are other areas that we need to look into also. Then the, uh, this paper becomes, I think, greatly more interesting. Okay, so hopefully that was an interesting historical perspective and also perspective on uh, the different communities and how they operate. I think security community is much more interested in investigating attacks if, if something is really practical and real. And I think that's what happened with Rolf Hammer. Okay, with that said, I think, thank you for the presentation. I think, uh, uh, please also, I think somebody asked your, for your slides, please send your slides so that they can be uploaded uh, on the website.